You guys are here tonight to hear from Kathy and Tony Momsen. Last year, they presented to us on part one of their Circle Minnesota trip. And tonight is part two. They uh, have been circumnavigating the state of Minnesota in, in two different sections. Um, half of it last, uh, last year and half of it this summer. And they've been circumnavigating it by canoe and bike. And when they're biking, they're towing their canoe with their bikes. And when they're canoeing, they're folding down their bikes and putting them in a the canoe. Um, so we heard about the trip last year, and this year they're going to um, they're going to do the do part two. The other interesting thing about it is that they also um, did a painting every day of their of their trip. Um, Kathy and Tony tell me they've been married for a long, long time and have always done outdoor stuff trip, a BWCA trip every year, cross country skiing, bike tours in Europe and the Pacific Northwest and California and New Mexico. And part of what their goal is on their trips is to make their day to day lives feel as relaxed as their trips. So now I'm going to turn it over to Tony and Kathy. So this year, this year we did finish up. We were not able to do that hybrid where we pulled the um, canoe behind our bicycle and then through the boundary waters. I We didn't really want to carry bicycles through the boundary waters. So we, um, so it's a slightly different trip than last year, but <clears throat> we will just charge ahead here. Well, it's actually not legal to have mechanical um, objects in the boundary water so you could oh. not even have the bicycles in the boundary what if you had them in a bag and you just what if you just had them in a pack and you never spun the wheels okay um okay so this welcome to our circle minnesota two adventure this slideshow is part two shown in blue all right, right. that doesn't show Okay, view. I just making sure I'm full screen. Okay. Now you're out of full screen. All right. Okay. Sorry. Okay. 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 Um, this slideshow is part two, shown in blue, of our bike canoe trip around the perimeter of Minnesota, where we biked the north shore of Lake Superior and canoed the length of the BWCA. These are two things we've always wanted to do, but never got to. In order to complete our Circle Minnesota, Minnesota, we forced ourselves to finally put these two adventures on our calendar. Part one, the next one, oh yeah, shown in red, was completed in 2021. We biked and canoed around the state from St. Croix Falls to International Falls. Here are a few slides from last year. We built a trailer to pull a canoe behind our bike, loaded our bikes and gear into our canoe, paddled down the St. Croix and Mississippi rivers, camping in some amazing places, paddling through eight locks, switching to bike mode and pedaling across Southern Minnesota seeing cute towns and epic bike trails. We hit a few rocks requiring repairs, paddled the dramatic north flowing Red River where low waters exposed bison bones and an especially sticky mud known as gumbo. We biked through International Falls and on September 15th, after 45 days, we finished the first leg at Rainy Lake at Robin and Becky's cabin. The next morning, they motorboated us on Rainy Lake to scout our first portage for 2022, the Gold Portage. We checked our family's summer schedule and decided to start our 2022 leg June 2nd. 
see the red line through Voyagers National Park. In February, we secured all camp reservations and entry permits. Tony's brother was going to join us for the Voyagers leg. Grand Portage Casino would hold our bikes until we arrived. At Grand Portage, we would pull our canoe behind our bikes down the North Shore to the St. Croix River and paddle to my mom's house to finish the circle. Then the floods came in the BWCA. This is a text from our friend Randy. I think you're smart to delay your adventure. My friend has a cabin on Lake Cabotogam, a Voy Voyagers National Park is dealing with extremely high and damaging water levels. Then Gold Portage closed indefinitely because of zebra mussels. We had shuttle issues. Chris's family came in June instead of July. We rescheduled and simplified the shuttle. Our final plan, we would first bike from Grand Portage to St. Croix Falls, then paddle the BWCA from Crane Lake to the Grand Portage. Wait, is there one more? Yeah. The North Shore Bike. For this section, with spectacular views of Lake Superior, it was easy to tell we were following the state's border. We packed for the bike leg in our Minneapolis apartment. It was nice we didn't have to pack food. There would be plenty of grocery stores along the way. We camped in Grand Portage Campground right by the casino with a view of the harbor. This is my sketch of the marina. Our plan was for us, like she said, to both of us do one drawing each day. The next day we biked north to the Canadian border and along the highway for the entire North Shore were masses of daisies. This is Tony's sketch of High Falls of the Pigeon River. We hiked to High Falls in Grand Portage State Park right on the border. The Grand Portage was created by Native Americans to bypass this and other non-canoeable sections of the P Pigeon River. At the Grand Portage Monument, we got our permits straightened out we parked our car out on Old 61, which is now a dead end dirt road. The officials had us put our permit on our dashboard, which said the exact days we were leaving our car. A bit unsettling, but we locked the car, made sure the lights were off, and we pedaled back to our campsite in Grand Portage. We woke up the next morning and we pedaled down the North Shore. We had perfect temperatures, and we had calm winds. And as we biked down Highway 61 and witnessed a calm Lake Superior, we imagined we could have canoed safely all the way to Duluth. We stopped several times for wild strawberries. Never had we seen them as big as these. A young Native American in Grand Portage suggested that the drought of 2021 and the big rains of 2022 would result in an excellent berry year. Nanabuja Lodge in Grand Marais, just north of Grand Marais. And this is a nice deck with a view of the lake. So then we made it to Grand Marais and to encourage passing cars to give us a little bit more room, we added the pool noodles. So about half of the North Shore, we biked on either completed sections of the Gitchigami Trail or on quiet roads, the remainder was on Highway 761. The new bike bridge just north of Grand Marais, a little stream, just imagine how crazy these streams were in May with the massive flooding. We camped at C Cascade State Park where they have hiker biker sites, which guarantees, guarantees you a site if you arrive by bike or by foot. I was reenacting a ski photo from the winter before with David and Julie. We camped at camped and watercolored at, oh, I'm sorry, I missed one. Okay, we smelt the strawberries as we biked on Highway 61. Sure enough, we stopped our bikes, 
and we saw the strawberries were just luscious. So we camped and watercolored at Eckbeck State Forest in Baptism River. Our neighbor at the campground was a Dutch guy who invented this custom survival vehicle. He brought it over on a ship and is traveling North America for a year. And although we originally planned to bike the canoes from Grand Portage to, to pass Duluth, we were happy to not have the canoe behind us when we were on Highway 61. I can hardly wait until they finish the entire Gammy Gitchy Gammy bike trail. The parts of the trail that are complete are the most amazing biking anywhere. The bike trail brought us right by Split Rock Lighthouse. These are stairs down to the old dock at Split Rock. Tracks were built from the dock up the hill to build and supply the lighthouse before 61 was built. The footings for the tracks are still there. We had lunch at Gooseberry Falls. The Gitchigami Trail goes around Silver Creek Tunnel, which led us right to Betty's Pies, where we had a mixed berry pie, then had to face highway construction for a mile or so. We camped at the Burlington Bay Campground in two harbors right on Lake Superior and enjoyed hanging out on the beach. The water was cold. We did not swim. Sorry, Ingrid. We rode Scenic 61, which was beautiful, then took an amazing bike trail into Duluth. I have earbuds to hear directions through Duluth and Superior. The route through the cities was on quiet roads and bike trails. The Bong Bridge to Superior, high above the St. Louis River, has a protected bike walk lane. We camped at Patterson State Park, just south of Superior, Wisconsin. In the morning, we left Patterson and Google Maps had us take the Gandhi Dancer Trail. <clears throat> it was rutted and unrideable for a mile or two. We gave up and got back on Wisconsin Highway 35. We learned later this section is for ATVs. We took Lake Country back roads to my family cabin near Webster, where we met our fat friends, Jane and Jack, at the cabin. The next day, we finished our bike leg on a very nice section of the Gandhi Dancer to St. Croix Falls. I hung out with my mom for a week at her house while packing and planning the canoe leg. <clears throat> So we abandoned the Voyager National Park section and moved our canoe starting point to Crane Lake. We had been using these large blue barrels for food, but now BWCA requires either hanging your food or using these bear vaults. We chose to bring three bear vaults. To, to fit in these vaults, we went with compact food like oatmeal, dried soups, freeze-dried dinners, and energy bars. Here are the biggest lakes and the longest portages of the trip. The small numbers are our campsites, the hashtags are the marine railroads, and the P's are for the pictographs. Tony's brother Craig drove us up to Crane Lake. In earlier plans, um, Craig was going to join us for Voyager National Park, but alas, it was not meant to be. And after a four hour drive, we arrived at the, our starting point at the end of the road there. And we loaded the canoe and said goodbye to Craig, headed north across Crane Lake. And we were greeted with a moderate headwind from the, from, um, from moderate headwind, but big waves from passing power boats. But then we turned southeast at a point of land. And now we were, there was a tailwind and no power boats. We entered the BWCA at Little Vermilion Entry Point. That was our permit one year later than was scheduled for last year. 
Little Vermilion was the, is a long and narrow, more like a river. Our trip follows the international border and these USA Canadian border markers show that we were on the right path. Maybe we didn't even need a map. We could have followed these the whole way. Our first portage was on the Marine Railroad to Loon Lake. The mechanical port portage is operated by a man who lives on the site for the summer. The carriage is rolled into the lake, into the water, and the boat is tied to the carriage and the carriage is pulled up with a cable. That is driven by an engine on the top of the hill and the engine runs on gasoline. The operator's residence overlooks the track. We did not use the Marine Railroad, but it is available for canoes too, for a fee. Our camp on Loon Lake had a sand beach. Our site was beautiful with no bugs until the sun went down. And five or six years ago, we started bringing camp chairs and now we're addicted. The next day we got to check out a Marine Railroad from Loon Lake to Lac La Croix. Seems affordable, especially considering how hard it would be to portage a fishing boat, but we hiked it anyway. So shortly after the Marine Railroad portage, we saw these cliffs that looked like we might find pictographs. And yes, there were dozens of little reddish symbols. We've never seen them quite this small. The images were the size of our hand. Lac La Croix is a big and beautiful lake. It took us longer than a day to paddle the length of it. In a quiet south-facing bay, we find, found a nice site with a giant resident snapping turtle and with amazing blueberries. They were so plentiful, we just sat down in the bushes and picked, hardly having to move. The berries satisfied our cravings for snacks we weren't able to pack on this trip. Still no bugs until dark, but they really swarm after sunset, so in the tent we went. There's nothing better than blueberries and almonds on our oatmeal in the morning. I chronicled my view from the latrine at each site. This is the view, and here's a little demo of our camping bidet. Thank you, Cornwalls. The next morning, still on Lac La Croix, we experienced some of the best pictographs in the Boundary Waters. They are painted on high cliffs that can be seen for miles down the lake. Like many pictographs, as we paddled along the cliffs, we first saw handprints. These handprints say, the story starts here. Moving along the cliff, we saw human figures, a snake, and maybe a oh, drum. Okay. Also, an amazing moose drawing. Finishing with more handprints. We portaged into Crooked Lake and are at campsite number three. We landed and realized we had camped here before. There we tested our one pound screen tent. It worked great, but was unnecessary. When the bugs came out, we just went to bed and we never set it up again. The tarp, however, we used half the nights. Notice the raindrops. The sun popped out for a beautiful sunset. The next morning, we were still following the markers. We saw bald eagle, with a dead fish. At the east end, Crooked Lake turns south, narrows and becomes the Basswood River. Soon we saw the telltale cliffs of more pictographs. This one looks like a drawing of a pelican. Okay. Oh, yeah. this is a moose and a little bird. And my favorite, a moose smoking a pipe. We wanna know how the artist got up high enough to paint that moose. 
Oh, two of them. At the lower basswood portage, we are still on the international boundary. The Minnesota Ontario boundary is a is unique with spectacular lakes, rivers, and waterfalls, much accessible only by canoe. The boundary route follows the largest lakes with the least portaging when traveling inland from Lake Superior to Lake of the Woods. Native Americans first developed this route hundreds of years ago. Voyagers followed the same route to transport furs from trading posts, including one on Rainy Lake, to the Grand Portage. Many people do this route every year, including those taking the Kruger-Waddell Challenge, where you try to finish the boundary route in eight days. This trip has been at the top of our bucket list forever. And I love hearing about all these records, but my goal when I plan a trip is so that I can enjoy it. So I wanted to make sure we had enough time to enjoy this thing. So paddling this boundary route is what I signed up to do in 2021. We were scheduled to leave on August 2nd when we lost our permit because of quetical fires. And then 10 months later, because it was flooded. So this last leg of the, this trip was supposed to be our first. We just learned you gotta be flexible. We tested a zinc oxide based sunscreen that never really rubs in. After a long basswood portage, and while I was paddling, I kept thinking the canoe kept leaning to the left. And then all of a sudden, one of my supporting brackets broke and I could not use my seat. Luckily, we found this great campsite and I suggested using a log as a temporary fix. Tony worked on the log and it worked. It was a, ended up being a beautiful evening on the western end of Basswood Lake. And each, each night, the mosquitoes swarmed the tent. And when we snuck out to pee in the middle of the night, dozens would get in. We used our paperbacks to take care of them before going back to sleep. We got it down to about five minutes. We could get them all killed within five minutes after we came back in. We are now at camp number five on Birch Lake. We got to our this next site because I had to go to the bathroom and because we had been in this stretch of the boundary water so many times. There was someone at the site, but they did not have tents set up. So we knew a back entrance to the latrine and of course excited that someone had left TP and a TP holder, even though I had my bidet. So when I got back to the canoe, the other canoes had pushed off and we claimed the site. We had had this exact, exact site last year with Mike and Liz, our, my son and his wife and their friends. And, and in 2020, we are here with Marty. In 2010, we camped very close to here with Tony's dads and brothers. In the 60s, Tony and his brothers paddled very close to here. And in 1999, our family survived the blowdown very close to this spot. Um, so again, we just really know this part of the boundary waters. It's a part we've been going to for a long time. Now, this is our next day. We are um, ready to go the next morning and it looked like we had a tailwind. Um, now, when we got to Knife Lake, we had a strong three-quarter tailwind from the northwest. It was really very windy and required concentration to keep the canoe pointing down the lake. We took cover. We took a carryover portage to Otter Track Lake, where we were protected from the wind. From Otter Track Lake, we took Monument Portage to Saganaga. Saginaga is a giant lake that we've been concerned about crossing for the last few days. And while battling the winds in this much narrower knife lake, we were happy we weren't on the big sag on that day. We camped in a protected bay on the western end of Saginaga, and we would be able to hit the big water early the next morning. So we got up at 4.20. We skipped breakfast and we started paddling by 540. It was calm in our bay and we thought with a little luck we could cross the lake before the wind picked up. 
So around the next point, we met three canoes that had been up since three o'clock because they had been on the they had been windbound on Blueberry Island in the middle of Saganaga the previous day. However, Saganaga was calm for our crossing. We only stopped after reaching the far east side and we cooked breakfast. So paddling east out of Saganaga, we have now gonna join Granite River. And here's a portage on the Gran Granite River where we met a group of young paddlers from Camp Minogen. They were heading for Grand Portage as well. We would see them again and again, leapfrogging up the river. Our first camp on Granite River, we enjoyed freeze-dried sweet and sour chicken donated to the trip by my sister, Mert. Again, blueberries were spectacular, and we had the pleasure of an international border marker right on our campsite. My sketch from that campsite, and this is the view from that camp. That's the direction we'll be headed in the morning. At our second campsite on the Granite River, the, the landing was a long hike to the fire pit. It was a beautiful site, high in a hill, but you did not want to forget anything in the canoes. We were high above the river and we were pretty much had to scale down the cliff to get water. And maybe because of the elevation, we had an internet connection at this site. We were able to receive a photo of our new granddaughter, Maya, all the way from Georgia. And every night, the same story. Once the sun set, we had tons of mosquitoes. <clears throat> the Granite River portages seem a little different from typical BWCA portages. It took two of us to get the canoe through this gap in the rocks, but it was still fun. This is one of our last portages on the Granite River. Next, we paddled into Gunflint Lake, where we stopped at Gunflint Lodge for lunch and a beer. The outfitters let us leave a pack with empty beer on um, bear vaults <laughs> and other stuff. A total of 27 pounds, we wouldn't have to lug over the one, two, and five mile portages. However, we would have to pick up the pack while driving home. <clears throat> That night. Oh, I'm sorry, I got distracted. Okay. You're good. Okay. You're good. Oh, so that that's what this does show. It shows those um bigger portage. So there was a two mile, the one mile, the four mile. So that's why we didn't want to keep those packs. So okay. All right. <clears throat> All right. So now you're on the east end. Um that night we camped on a state forest site called Fish Camp on the eastern end of Gunflint Lake. This site had a picnic table. What a luxury, since we had just gave up our chairs. Gunflint Lake allows motorboats. It's kind of amazing how quiet our site was. I think we saw a total of two boats the whole evening. One second, I'm gonna go through there. Oh, that's nice. On the east end of Gunflint Lake, we portage to North Lake. This is a flat portage with a retired marine railroad. The next portage was called Height of Land, which is on the Continental Divide. We had been paddling upstream from Crane Lake to this point. After Height of Land, the current will be downstream to Lake Superior. From South Lake, we could see the cliff on Rose Lake to our east. There was just one tricky portage before Rose. The portage was rocky and had a minimal landing area. From the portage toward Rose Lake, we could see two trumpeter swans and one signet. The first part of Rose Lake is narrow and shallow. The cliffs on Rose are spectacular. We were a bit concerned about finding a site on Rose Lake. There are about eight sites. The first three were taken. It was getting late 
And if we didn't get a site, we would be taking the two mile portage as the sun was setting. As we rounded a point, we saw two groups of canoes leaving stairway portage to our right, heading east. So we steered our canoe toward one site down the lake, which turned out to be open. Woohoo! The evening, that evening, two women paddled by and asked what time we were leaving in the morning. They said the site was their favorite and wanted to nab it. It was a great sight, 10 out of 10, a rocky point with a breeze, a nice view of a huge birch tree from the latrine, a good canoe landing and tent sites. At 7 a.m., the women oh, were sir. floating in front of our camp, fully packed for the move in as promised. <clears throat> We got an early start on Rose Lake heading east. Our first portage is the two mile long portage, which runs along a nice stream. After a hundred rods, the portage was flooded. So we loaded up the canoe and hopped in. We paddled right down the portage trail. What a great 41st anniversary paddle. Last year on this day, we were on the Mississippi River. After a while, we arrived at the Beaver Dam that was the source of the flooding. Don't, for, don't forget, Kathy had to remove and carry the log to support her seat at every portage. The next three lakes had giant cliffs and campsites that were hard to see from the water. We camped on the third lake which is called Moose. Our site had a huge pine tree and a beautiful forest. Okay, the Pigeon River and the Grand Portage. Okay, there's always one day on an adventure when all your collective weaknesses seem to shine. The day started out perfect. We left Moose Lake by 7 a.m. We got to the one mile full foul portage. Tony took the canoe. I took one of the pack. After 20 minutes, Tony set down the canoe and went back for the second pack. I continued forward and I was going up and I was going up and up. I had to take my pack off, lift it up, climb up the rock and then pick up my pack. I did this for a while, and then I headed back to get my second pack. I met Tony. He had seen the Minogen campers, and they had marked the rapids uh, on our map. The two of us kept going up. I helped Tony with the canoe. We lifted over down trees and up rocky hills. We were for sure on the portage because I saw a tea bag on the trail. So on the top of the cliff, we both sat down to take a break and Tony decided to hike down to make sure we were on the right path. We hadn't heard the Minogen kids for a while. And I laid in the grass and I could see on Google Maps that we were not on the hiking trail, that we, that was, we were on a hiking trail that was bringing us away from the Pigeon River. I was deflated. When Tony returned, he said he went, he, that we went the wrong way. And now in retrospect, he remembers the, the Minogen leader telling the kids to take a right turn. So after two lost hours, we got back to the right turn. We ate our lunch and we finished the portage at 2.45. I suggested we camp on the portage. I figured there wasn't, wouldn't be a reasonable tent site on this swampy river. Tony said, let's move forward a little ways. I just want to get the feel of the Pigeon River. And I said, okay, how were the Minogen campers going to do the rapids? Tony said, they plan on walking down the two miles of rapids. Our map showed the English portage around much of it. And I'm like, okay, that sounds doable. So we went an easy 15 minutes and then the rapids. And they were not ferocious, but they were moving and shallow. And we kept getting stuck. And I said, it's time to walk through the rapids. But walking in the rapids when you're 65 is difficult when you have slippery ankle twisting rocks. So I'm in the front of the canoe thinking, 
We should be camping back at the portage instead of exhausted and suffering through these rapids. I should have been more forceful. And then we saw something that looked like the English portage on our left. The landing was difficult. We hiked for 10 minutes and then the stupid path brought us right back into the river in a really rapidy place. What was this thing? We bumped and scraped and a little further, then we saw the Swamp River to our right, which meant there was no portage. After the fact, we learned the English portage is long gone. So we think we might've had a historic map or just a really bad one. Okay, we live through the rapids and I can take a boring swamping paddling. It actually was peaceful for a while. And then after a while we started to hear voices and we saw this wild activity up a mudslide on the hill. It was the Minogian campers exiting the river for the portage around a portage around Partridge Falls. We would never see, we would have never seen this portage if the Minogian kids had not been exiting at that exact moment. The sun was getting pretty low, but it was not too much further to Fort Charlotte, which is our reserve campsite. Exhausted, but it was so meaningful to see the Grand Portage sign and to know that Native Americans and voyagers have been coming to this exact spot for so many years and we made it. This is Tony's dad and Jean Jensen and two other paddlers who did the similar route in 1965, finishing at the Grand Portage as well. So at our campsite, I sat down on a picnic table bench and looked down at my legs and there was blood coming from my leg. I am like, what now? And I thought I had gashed my shin on one of the rocks and I pulled up my pants and under my pants, uh, um, there was hundreds of baby leeches on my leg and it just continued to bleed. Well, Fort Charlotte is a beautiful spot in the middle of nowhere, and I'm so glad we got there, but I was also excited to eat and get into the sleeping bag. Hitting the Grand Portage after a good breakfast. First, Kathy had to pitch her canoe seat support log into the Pigeon River. No need to carry that on this last portage. <clears throat> Our continuous trip around the state encouraged us to explore the Grand Portage, first from the Lake Superior end, and then approach it by canoe from the Pigeon River, just the way the Native Americans and voyagers did. First, you, you first read the history at the fort, and then you feel the history in your muscles after your canoe and portage. The Voyager's packs weighed 90 pounds and they portaged eight miles. Ours weighed 30 and we portaged four and a half and we were dead. Our plan was to try to one trip the portage. Kathy added more weight to her backpack and would carry a day pack on her front. I carried a very light pack and the canoe. The system worked for three and a half or four miles. Then we switched to our trip and a half system. We continued portaging. Kathy was ahead for a while. Then she came back excited, saying she had seen the car. We finished the portage. The car started. We loaded the canoe on top, turned the car around and headed toward Highway 61 and imagined what we were going to have for dinner. The end. Oh, oh, this is um, for next year's adventure. We marked in pink our, do you describe it? Um, as I was going, my thought is um, I love all the pictographs. So where you see all those um, pink marks are where there's all the known pictographs in the boundary waters in Quetico. So we're going to do a trip to try to um, hit all the pictographs in the boundary waters in Quetico. Okay. Do you want to show a little more? Oh, we have a few little extras. If anybody wants a little extra family history, this is his mom. Okay, tell the story. I don't um, know. This. Oh, we don't. We don't know the story, but this is his mom and his um, mom's and his aunt. So this was a uh, um, she with her first paycheck. It's not this canoe, but with her first paycheck, she bought an aluminum canoe. So um, canoeing's actually in his 
definitely in his history. And this is his dad in the Boundary Waters. With a canoe he made. He made made this canoe. In 1964. Is that his canoe? Yeah, it's probably the picture taken in we, the we early think, 60s. And we think this is in Bailey Bay for people that know the Boundary Waters. We think that's right. On, ba on Basswood. On Basswood. This is his mom and dad camping. Um, this is Tony and his mom. I love the purse in the canoe. This is our um, oldest son when he was, oh, I'm not sure which one is when it actually, we should have figured this out. Same canoe. Same canoe. Um, Same canoe that my dad made. Right. So is this Chris at eight months? Yeah. No, well, there, no, I don't think that was, he was older there. This is actually when you brought him on Memorial Day. So he was, Chris was 10 months old um, in the Boundary Waters. Um, this is Chris and Mike eating. Um, we always had syrup in the little um, containers there. And that was, his dad made that food box. So they ate off the food box. Um, I think this might've been part of the, we did a um, Hunter's Island. So I think this is the kids yep. in the Hunter's Island. Oop, yep. Um, this is the second trip. Mike's. I think oh, this. Mike. Well, this is Mike. I know. So Mike. I think might be this. This might be the that's same. Same. Yeah. Enough and that's it. That's it. Oh, a couple of watercolors, and that's it. Okay. Thank you. That's it. So what do we have to do something? Thank you very much. Okay. Um, if Thank anyone you. has. To yeah. Um, Jen, were you going to say something? I was just going to say if anyone has any questions, they can speak up or put their questions in the chat. And Greg asks, were there a lot of trees down on Grand Portage? When he did it in 2017, there were like 50 trees at waist height across the trail. You go ahead. I, we, we show a picture of that, but I probably only remember maybe Four, four, yep. four, probably four or five. It was, it was actually pretty good. But you know, you only take your you take a picture when you have everything down. So that's why. You but got but the on the other hand, when we first were like getting reservations, they said the the part closest to the Pigeon River was open, and the part closest to Lake Superior, the half close to Lake oh, Superior, was closed and we, so at we, that time. And we didn't do the other part. So and we, we didn't do from sixty one so we, we, from we, old sixty one to Lake Superior. We didn't do the last three and a half miles or something. We did it, but we did it on bike and not by foot. And we didn't go on the trail okay. on our bikes, did we? No, we did no. not. No. Oh. Do you ever uh, do you ever have like an art show of all your watercolors? <laughs> oh, I we we have had I for the last time I, I I'm a studio artist in Northrop King Building in um, Minneapolis, so Northeast Minneapolis. So last for the last one, I actually it was a fundraiser. I sold the um, watercolors for twenty twenty dollars, and I gave the money to the the Northeast um, Minneapolis Art Association. So they they I, I do definitely. So if you want to, I, I can send you my um, email and my studio. So my I'll be at the studio on Saturday from um, I think it's from ten to four this week. Is the the Northrop King has open studio art hours? Bring some. Yeah, no, she'll, I'll, I'll, I'll she'll bring, bring some watercolors bring for you to look at. If you want to look at some of the watercolors, they, they're they're small. I can show you the size. They're just like um like they're like postcard size. Is what these are. Yeah, oh yeah, that was my other question. How you could haul all this artwork around and not? <laughs> they're little. Yeah, they're little. It's small. <laughs> okay. okay. Oh. I let him talk, and I can maybe show you what we're doing. They're very nice. <laughs> it looks like Greg has his hand up. Yeah, I was going to say, I, I maybe I'll talk to you later in a breakout room. But I think I used to canoe race against you at Hoy Gardens. I saw your Max Craft paddle and heard you talking about Gene Jensen. Did you paddle with your son in like a C one at Hoy Gardens back in the day? We might have, yeah, we might have. We've done Hoygar's races in the in the old days. Um, yeah. Mainly, I paddled with Kathy. We tried to talk our kids into racing a couple. I think of I yeah, yeah, now I remember. Yeah, you two were with your kids in the middle. That's what it was. I was a teenager. Yeah, we did that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Fun. So this is just the size of the paper, so you can just kind of see compared to our heads, and then. And my our watercolors are just in a small thing like this, so we're just watercoloring from there. So we just have everything in a thing. It is an extra, you know, when you're 
when you decide you're not going to bring something and then all of a sudden you have your watercolor, you do question it. And we did debate with 14 days of whether we should have done a drop, you know, like not had ever, like things, but we did like, we did gun flint then we did get rid of all the finished watercolors. So we didn't have to bring those that last part of that. So. Kathy, how long is your next trip going to be the one with the pictograph? Oh. We haven't gotten that far, but we think it might be like um, 30, is it about three weeks, four weeks? We think between three and four, th four weeks. So we did, we got the books on where they are. It's still all in like planning stages. So that's. <laughs> we need well, a map. We'll have you back next year. <laughs> <laughs> 